Hey guys, and welcome to the show. I have Jim Muller with me today. Hey, Jim. Hey, how you doing, Lex? Good, man. Um, so, uh, what's your role? So, uh, as a 20-year veteran of Microsoft, I've had quite a few uh, roles. About 18 of those years, I've been involved in some way, shape, or form with security. So, kind of now is kind of my, my time. It's like, uh, you know, security wasn't something we really thought about 20 years ago. Now, I'm uh, after 20 years, it only took me 20 years to become one of the cool kids on the block. So uh, today I work for the Cybersecurity Solutions Group, that group within Microsoft, where, we, where we're consolidating a lot of our cybersecurity excellence, both in product and in incident response, responding to our customers. So specifically within that group, which is led by uh, Ann Johnson, our CVP, I'm on the detection and response team, which is our externally facing incident response capability that we offer to our customers via uh, the premier contractual vehicle. Wow, that's awesome. So I understand you've got some uh, slides you want to share with us today. Yeah, what we're going to be talking about. So as a lead investigator, I lead engagements with all kinds of customers out there, medical, manufacturing, uh, banks, government. And so what we're going to talk about is you know, first of all, what is our differentiator as Microsoft in the way we approach incident response? And how is it faster and more effective than some of our uh, competitors? Not that our competitors do anything wrong with incident response. We just take a different approach to it, feeding the goals of mitigation and recovery. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that works and how that plays into a greater uh, ecosystem of how to respond to an incident. And then we're going to talk about some things that are going to be, I think, quite interesting and shocking in that what exactly are our customers doing and not doing that is leading them to be exposed to these uh, newer cyber attacks, which we're going to find are not that new. Some of the motivations are different. Some of the uh, techniques for initial entry are different. But I think what you're going to find is some of the root causes of things that we have been preaching to our customers for many years are still at the end of the day, those things that are allowing these customers to be compromised. Wow, that sounds awesome. All right. Well, let's get started. Fantastic. So when we talk about having a cybersecurity situation or incident, really we are talking about two separate phases that you're gonna to need to go through at that point. Phase one is the incident response or investigation. That's what we traditionally think about when we do a cybersecurity incident response, but that's not it. There's a second phase of that where we have to actually deal with the results of that investigation. So the IR or the incident response, the first phase is just that, it's investigation. What happened? How did it happen? Are there remaining persistence mechanisms that the attacker either is or can use to come back in action in the environment? That data collected from the investigation is is gathering that data to hand it over to some sort of recovery process. Now, the Microsoft process is, is our outputs are very well suited to the Microsoft Consulting Services compromise recovery offering. However, the data that we produce really can be used in any recovery process, whether you want to attempt to do the recovery yourself or you have some other third party that's going to help you with that recovery process. Now, the one question that we always get is, well, you know, what if we have an active attacker running around during the course of the investigation? Are you just going to let that go? Well, of course, we're not going to let that go. Now, there are there is a school of incident response thought that when you're doing the investigation, you don't want to taint the results or you don't want to tip the attacker off to what you're doing. That really is an outdated line of thinking. In today's threat landscape, quite honestly, the attackers don't care if you're on to them or not, or no or not. It's really not going to change their behavior in any significant way. And how can you really allow data be, to be flowing out the door or allow a ransomware destructive malware attack to, per, to perpetrate across your environment. We, we just can't allow that to happen. So in the course of incident response, if we find an active attacker during the course of the investigation, we of course are going to apply mitigating steps to contain and stop that attacker and stop whatever they are trying to do. Now, we have to caution, however, 
that in no way is a recovery process. That is a tactical emergency mitigation step. You still need to follow up the incident response with some sort of organized recovery process to operationalize whatever we happen to do in the incident response if we went beyond investigation and go further to harden the environment and recover positive control of the environment from whatever the attacker did. So there's a real difference between what we hear is going on in the cyber threat landscape and what is actually going on in the cyber threat landscape. So we see great headlines, both in the popular press and in the, the security trade press. We have the ransomware, we have the phishing, we have billions of records exposed. So we're seeing the consequences of the cyber attack, but we're never really talking in detail about what was the root cause that allowed that attack to happen. And so we believe, based on the outcomes that we see from these cyber attacks, that we that all of these techniques and the attackers are innovating and doing very sophisticated things and they're really progressing the art, which is really not the case. We're gonna talk about in a couple minutes what's really going on. The same mechanisms, basic mechanisms of attack have not fundamentally changed in the last 10 years. However, motivations and what the end goal of the attackers are and how we monetize things as an attacker, that really is what's actually changed in their goals. And we'll talk about how that manifests itself as an attack progresses. But really, what, what's, what in your architecture is allowing this to happen? Well, our own CISO, Brett Arsenault, he bases Microsoft security uh, posture on basically three things. If you boil it right down, he calls it the three-legged stool. And if you take away any of these legs, of course, the stool is going to fall over. And the reason we take this kind of security strategy is for all practical purposes, Microsoft, as well as most large and even medium enterprises, are, are perimeterless. We can't depend on traditional perimeter network physical security to protect our, our environment because we've promised a perimeterless world to our users. We've promised that you're going to be able to get your data anytime you want it, wherever you are, on whatever device you happen to have. So that destroys the perimeter of our network that traditionally has allowed us some semblance of control and, and protection. We still have to have that. You still have to have that. The, the attackers expect you're gonna have a basic competence in perimeter network security. We've been doing that for 30 years, but they're really, that's not what they're concentrating and that's not what they're attacking on. 95% of what we see in incident responses really boil down to a couple basic things. First and foremost, ever since credential theft became a thing about 10 years ago, where I could actually steal NTLM credentials directly out of memory and replay those credentials without providing the password and replaying them across the environment, it's basically been a cornerstone of attacker behavior. So if we protected administrative credentials, protected identity, and that's the first leg of the stool, is identity. Not only protecting administrative identity, which is the most critical, because if I compromise administrative identity, I automatically get everything else, but uh, but also comp but also protecting individual identity that limits the attacker's ability to initially gain entry into the environment, or at least gain entry to what, what you have available to you, your identity. So that's the first cornerstone, is identity protection. The second thing is, protection of data, classification and protection of data. And we've known that for many years, but we take it one step further in that we don't treat all of our data equally. And so because of that, there are rules surrounding under what circumstances and conditions I access my data. You know, it's very, you know, Microsoft, Microsoft has a reputation for naming things, you know, ridiculously over the years, but this is one thing that is named very, very concisely and specifically uh, in O365, conditional access. Now, in that case, it's talking about under what conditions I can access my email, but taken as a concept beyond that, the conditions by which I can access data. What kind of device are you coming from? Where are you coming from? Are there any, you know, are there any concerns by the way you you are coming. You know, have I seen a log on here and then another log on there and you couldn't have possibly traveled, that impossible travel. So the different conditions by which I can access my data and how stringent I'm gonna hold you to those conditions. Some data, I might not care. 
you know, ah, if I've got one anomaly in your identity, I'm not necessarily going to stop you from accessing this classification classification of data over here, but more sensitive data over there, you need to meet all of the qualifications of identity and before I'll let you get to that. So there's much more around management of of uh, of data that warrants realistically its own podcast into itself. But that is one of the cornerstones is is that data. And the secret to that is we don't treat everything equally. If you treat everything equally, we end up diluting our security ability rather than concentrating on the things that actually happen. And the third thing is device health. I can control device health, whether I have a domain dom domain uh, joint device, a active device, directory domain, join device, Intune or SCCM, managed or even third party management of my patch status and health of that device. And of course, mobile device management, management of the health of those devices. And once again, if I don't come in on a Microsoft managed device and my health is assured, then I'm not getting access to certain classifications of data or let in at all. And so when we translate that to a larger picture, most of our instant responses come down from the initial entry to the environment to two things. People still not managing administrative identity. We published the past the hash white paper version one and version two, you know, almost nine years ago. And if we did those fundamental things in those white papers 10 years ago, no technology involved there. It's process and how we approach application of administrative identity, you know, we, we would cut the legs out of a vast majority of the current mechanisms of attacker behavior. And then secondly, you know, even older than that, we've been talking about patching even even older, patch your stuff. And the reason is, well, hey, you know, we, we find a vulnerability, either us or a third party product, and we patch it. What's the big deal? Why are you still talking about patching? Because you have to actually apply those patches and not only apply those patches, but apply those patches relatively quickly. Because when a patch comes out, you know, you are not the only one who's downloading that patch. So is the attacker trying to see if that patch is something that can be exploitable and they can weaponize. And the speed at which they're able to do that has dramatically, dramatically increased over the years. It used to take them weeks to figure out how to weaponize a uh, and reverse engineer a vulnerability or a patch. Now it can be as little as 24, 48, 72 hours, and they can weaponize it if it's a good one. And so every month when patches are released, both us and third party products, the attackers are quickly looking at those and seeing is there anything in there that's going to be worth us reverse engineering like the escalation of privilege patches, anything that I can connect with unauthenticated access, spoof certificates. There's a whole classification of things they're looking for. And, you know, there's not something every single month that they're going to be able to use. But if there is, the speed at which they can weaponize that is probably way faster than you're actually patching your environment, giving them a window of opportunity to attack and take advantage of that. So that being said, our team deals with those situations. Our team is uh, designed, is, we are customer externally facing incident response capability. Now the really important thing, and we're gonna talk about this at the end of how you access our services, we are under premier paper. We are under premier agreements. That is extremely important for you, meaning you basically already have the contractual framework in place to engage us and quickly engage us, and we can come and, and help you with incident response. We like to say that if you have a premier agreement, you basically have incident response capability on retainer. And you may even say, well, wait a minute, I, I don't have you know enough money in my in my premier agreement or premier account to cover this. We don't worry about that on the at the onset. If you basically agree that you want our services, we start the motion quickly and we figure out all of the balancing of the accounts in the end. And so we'll talk about how you do that engagement. But just keep in mind right up front, you already have contractually in place what you need to engage us with no additional lengthy paperwork or contracts. So that's really, really good. And so we are designed to respond to security incidents and help our customers become more cyber resilient. And you see all these icons in the bottom. When we do incident response, we bring a multitude of skill sets into the environment to help in the situation. And generally these are on-site engagements. 
we have lead investigators, we have uh, threat hunters, we have infrastructure consultants, which helps you get our infrastructure in place necessary for the investigation. Uh, plus, if there's any immediate you know, remediation activity that has to happen, we can quickly um, help you with that as well. Reverse engineers, we have cloud analysis and forensics. So we really have comprehensive skill sets that we bring to bear on your particular situation. So what makes us different? How do we do what we do? And so Microsoft does not do traditional forensics. And traditional forensics is not a bad thing. There's value in traditional forensics, but it doesn't really feed the goals that we have to rapidly determine what is causative in your environment, to be able to feed those things to the compromise recovery team so they can start formulating a rapid you know, onset recovery plan for you. But if we also find active attacker in your environment, we are not going to stand by and watch data flying out the door. And we're not going to let your environment get burned to the ground through a ransomware or destructive malware. If, if we come in and we see them setting up for that, it hasn't happened yet, but they're setting up for it, you know, we're not going to let we're not going to let that happen. And if you're in the midst of a ransomware attack, we can help you rapidly return to service through containment and rapidly uh, trying to help you reconstitute your environment. The old thinking that if you have an actor in your environment, well, we want to stay quiet. We don't want to change anything. We don't want to do anything because we'll tip the attacker off and then they'll do X. Well, realistically, that that never was really the case. You know, there were a couple rare circumstances where an attacker would actually would actually respond to your actions in a in an even more destructive way, but that's not really their goals. They don't want to throw away necessarily their investment in that attack by doing something harsh or doing something you know rash. And so you say, well, they're going to go underground. They're going to be quiet. They're going to stop doing what they're doing. Our investigative model accounts for that and tries to root them back out so we can find out find out where they are. So, you know, with our approach, there is no downside. To, to acting if the attacker looks like they're going to do something damaging. Now, if we find the attacker has been there for 200 to 300 days and they're basically in maintenance mode, well, yes, there might not be a good reason to really be aggressive with them at that point and leave that to the more comprehensive compromise recovery. Because if we have to do attacker containment, it is not the end of the journey. We are doing tactical maneuvers to stop that actor activity and to ensure we have increased detective capability so that we can uh, see the actor's activity in more resolution. But that is very tactical in nature. That is not going to fix the core elements in your environment that allowed that attack to happen in the first place. That's where you go to compromise recovery, where they more comprehensively deal with the root cause issues that allowed the attack to occur in your environment. So we like to make that very clear that even if we don't always do attack containment during our investigations, our primary function is investigation and turn that investigative information over to you, which you then share with our compromise recovery team if you wish to engage their services. It is not primarily to uh, re-architect your environment or, or do anything unless it is a emergency situation. Now, what makes us different from traditional forensics? I said we don't do traditional forensics. So, for example, if you want a forensically sound image that you can share with law enforcement, for example, we don't do that. That's not what we do. All of our techniques and tools do not produce those chain of evidence, forensically sound uh, elements that like a law enforcement may want. And 99% of the time, that's OK. That never stops us from what, what we're doing. Our superpower in this is, is twofold. Our first superpower is we're the factory team. Nobody knows this environment. Nobody knows this better than we do. Our second superpower, almost I would say even greater than that, is that we are not coming to you as Microsoft necessarily saying, hey, we're so smart, do this, do that, because we said so because we're so smart. No, we're bringing the experiences of all of the other customers who have been through very similar circumstances to you. And we have a volume as such that no matter how big you are, no matter how small you are, no matter how sophisticated you are or possibly dysfunctional you are, you're generally not going to be that unique because we have probably seen somebody in a very similar, if not exact circumstances yours. And so we know what was a good 
use of our time? What was a bad use of our time? What was effective and worth it? What ended up being not effective? So we can help bring the lessons learned from other customers' experiences to make your experience as as good as it can get in these kind of circumstances. So the way we do this is first and foremost, we use data science. So instead of a traditional forensic approach where we start with something that we know is bad and then we work out from there following the trail of breadcrumbs, which is a slow and arduous process, has value. Once again, don't get me wrong. That approach has value. And in fact, if you're already doing that or you have somebody in there doing that, our approach is complementary to that. And so it's not one or the other per se. So our approach is we cast, cast a wide net throughout the entirety of the environment, and then we use data science to compare your environment against itself, looking for anomalies. And then we start narrowing down on those anomalies and looking at them in more depth and detail. The primary tool that we use to do that is a proprietary run once scanner that we've developed over the years called ASEP. It, it you know, very generically stands for, you know, auto start extensibility point, because that's when we started doing this 10 years ago or so, that's what we actually did is we would actually use, you know, um, auto runs from sys internals. We dump everything that starts when Windows starts up, and then we'd look at things that we didn't know what it was, and we narrow down on those outliers. Well, we still do that. That's still in this more comprehensive tool, but we do many, many other things. We look at certificate signing. We look at things running out of unusual locations. We're looking at scheduled tasks, and we're looking at all kinds of things, and then we collect this data is very quick it uh it's in fact it's limited to one one uh you know one core one process so it's not going to slow your machine down nobody's going to know anything happened so we have you deploy this tool across your entire environment and then it brings the data back to a central share in your environment and then uploads it into a data to an azure storage blob where it gets put into our back-end analytics engine where we do analysis on it looking for anomalies looking for outliers in your environment and if we find something, we'll have you collect samples of that. Or if it's a machine we're particularly interested in, we have a, a Windows uh, online forensic extractor, it's called Wolf, that will look at volatile data on that machine, trying to build a timeline of that thing's activities that we're interested in. And then we bring that back and, and do further analysis. And we can do this relatively rapidly. The vast majority of our engagements are five days. And we can process about 50,000, 50,000 endpoints per five days. And now sometimes we can do more, sometimes depending on your situation, we can, we can do less. And we scope this as you'll see when we actually engage with you exactly what we're looking at. But the vast majority of our engagements is that, that five days. Now, if it goes longer, we do have additional SKUs that are just a little bit less if you go second week or third week, but those are rare. Generally, if we don't have to do attacker containment, generally most of our, our engagements are one week, which is unheard of. If you've ever been through an incident response, having a complete analysis within one week is, is unheard of. Well, how can we do it so fast? Because we're using this data science approach and our goals are to get those things necessary for formulation of a comprehensive recovery plan. Now, we had a hole though. We had a hole in our process that we discovered a couple of years ago in that, Attackers haven't generally innovated very much over the last 10 years, except they've been adding to their toolbox for their general approach. So we all know about credential theft and we all know about this and that. OK, great. So they generally relied on malware to do those things and they still do for their initial entry into the environment rely on malware. But once they're in and they have a foothold and they start moving around, they abandon that malware and they start using malware less techniques. This is where, this is really their only, only innovation over the last few years. So they'll start using PowerShell or WMI or PSExec or other techniques that never really hit disk. They, they run in memory and so no AV is really gonna catch this. So our ASAP tool wasn't catching it either. DLL side loading, taking a bad DLL and loading it into a legitimate executable, having running, running malicious processes, but the executable itself is absolutely fine. You know, so AV doesn't do well with that and ASAP doesn't do well with that. Um, so what is our, our 
line of defense there? Well, we decided that we were going to develop technologies to look in memory and watch the process stack and look for these things. Well, we thought about this for a while, but then we realized we're not as smart as we think we were because Microsoft already has a product that does this in Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. So we decided that in customers that do not have, you know, Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection, that we would tactically deploy Defender uh, ATP under trial license for the purposes of investigation. So we do that now, and we are very, very good at it rapidly. In fact, if it's Windows 10 and Server 2016 and above, it's no big deal. It's basically we set the tenant up, we send out a GPO to have the operating system point to the tenant, and it's done because the machinery to feed telemetry into Defender ATP is built directly into the operating system. If you still have some Windows Server 2012 and so on and so forth around, you can and also install the MMA agent that will also report telemetry up into Defender, uh, Defender ATP, although not quite as comprehensively. This allows us, this is what allows us to watch the endpoint at the process execution stack, looking for things like, hey, I see Outlook cranked up a command prompt, which ran a base 64 encoded PowerShell. That's not right. None of that hit disk. None of that hit disk. It was our threat intelligence and machine learning that saw that and knew it wasn't right, and it's gonna raise it as a high acuity alert. And depending on your configuration, it could also stop it. So we use that as a, a core piece of our investigative capability because we also have access to the advanced hunting platform where we have uh, additional queries where we hunt in your environment and find and find things through manual techniques from our from our analysts. So then, you know, we're patting ourselves on the back and we're thinking we're pretty smart. And then we realize, well, wait a minute, 90, 90 plus percent are identity attacks, really looking at things from the endpoints, not catching that those identity things. And so then we also decided if you don't have Azure Advanced Threat Protection, which is an example of Microsoft naming things horribly, because it really, yes, it lives in Azure, but what it's really doing is it's watching your on-prem domain controllers and Azure Active Directory for anomalous logons, specifically anomalous uh, administrative logons. And so you know, other things like pass the ticket with Kerberos attacks, golden ticket Kerberos attacks, all kinds of other things related to identity and administrative access to the environment. So we decided to tactically deploy Azure Advanced Threat Protection also. So realistically, we're squeezing the attacker between this data collected in the one-time scan, data collected at the top through Azure ATP, you know, in your administrative identity, and then the endpoint telemetry coming from Defender ATP on the bottom, we're squeezing the attacker in the middle. And so once again, this sounds like a lot, but we are very good at getting this done very, very, very quickly. In fact, if you call us for an instant response, while our people are in the air coming to you, we're working with you remotely over the phone to get these tools deployed and get things set up so that we have data flowing once we arrive and make best use of our on-premises time. And another reason that we're so fast at, at what we do in identifying this stuff is that modern detection really leans and relies upon um, threat intelligence and endpoint telemetry. And nobody has more of that than Microsoft does. So that really is a force multiplier in our capability, allowing us to identify high acuity risks relatively rapidly, even if it didn't happen in your tenant, but happened somewhere else, because that data lake in the back end is offering protection for everybody. It quickly, quickly uh, covers protection for you as well. And then we talked about this a bit. If you have an active attacker in your environment, we actually will do containment. What does that actually look like? Uh, basically resetting or blocking administrative accounts, uh, targeting certain AD attributes for hardening, uh, implementing MFA if it's in the cloud and certain identities are at risk. It's really a case-by-case -case basis on what we do. If it's a ransomware, we might be doing less investigation and more recovery of your environment so that you can start that restoration process. So that really is bespoke and custom to the particular situation that you're in. So just to be clear, once again, our, our piece of this pie is the detection response.
So protection and recovery really are in the purview if you want Microsoft assistance for those things, proactive protections and recovery following the cyber incident after the investigation is the purview of Microsoft Consulting Services in the, in the offerings that Kate's going to talk about. So the trends, actors uh, are well resourced and they're determined and they're they're professionals. These aren't amateurs. They have timelines, they have goals, they have return on investment goals. And so when they look at you, they're looking at you from a cost benefit analysis. And so that makes it once you have one of these attackers, it's really one of our goals is to figure out what are their motivations so we can make it less attractive for them to stay or continue to deal with you. From the defender standpoint, you know, most IT environments have still not implemented the stringent protections around administrative identity and protecting those administrative identities. And also, we talked about Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection as an investigative tool that we use, but let's talk more generically as a technology that enterprises need. Enterprises must have endpoint detection response capability, EDR, whether it's ours or third party. We have to be watching the endpoints at the process execution level, especially because of these malware-less techniques, AV is not enough. So if you're spending a lot of money still in core physical networking protections, we have to look at what the actors are actually doing and start investing in those technologies to combat what actors are actually targeting these days, which is identity and uh, malware-less techniques. So, this slide shows the lack of sophistication of the attackers, but they're still able to make it work. The vast majority of attacks into environments are still starting with spear phishing because they know and we know and everybody knows no matter how good your defenses are, there's going to be some, no matter whose technologies you're using, there's going to be some phishing that are still going to get through and get to end users. And no matter how much education we do, those end users, somebody's going to click the link. So you will always lose desktops. Okay. Now, with proper techniques, with proper architecture and proper detective and protective controls, we can minimize that. And that's what our goal is. A random end user to an attacker should not be very valuable to them. But it is today with a lot of organizations because they're set up where once I get one random user, I'm able to laterally traverse and get more random users and then create an attack net that allows me to wait for an administrator to log into one of those effective machines and then privilege escalate. That is 95% of what we see. Spearfish in, laterally traverse, somebody with a valuable identity logs in, and then here you go. Guess what? I've lost my administrative identity to the system. Because the fundamental fact is we are always going to lose sheep to the wolves. But when we start losing shepherds, we've got a huge, huge problem. And so those core fundamentals of identity protection and protecting against lateral traversal is really, really still fundamentally important. So wait a minute, but this is not what I'm seeing. You're saying it's the same thing for the last 10 years, but that's not what I'm seeing in the news. It is. OK, the techniques to get in and get control of your environment are fundamentally unchanged. Yes, we have new attack surface with the cloud. So if you're not multi-factoring your O365 or cloud facing identities, you're just making it easier for them to go ahead and take advantage of newer techniques like password sprays against that cloud authentication edge. So we need to multi-factor that and we need to get rid of legacy authentication on that. So but still, it's fundamentally an identity attack. What fundamentally has changed is that cloud-facing identities. Uh, we also have some malware-less techniques. The other thing that's relatively disturbing is actually a rolling back of sophistication where attackers are relying less and less on bespoke custom malware developed directly for you. You know, that advanced persistent threat that we always hear about, the APT, where we're looking for malware that was that was created just for you. Well, you know what? That's not the attacker's first line of entry anymore. They try to use commodity malware that we would have two years ago said, oh yeah, this is irritating. You need to take care of this. You need to figure out why your AV is not cleaning this up, but it's not fundamental to our investigation of an advanced persistent threat. Okay. Well, those same malwares, Emotet, Drydex, TrickBot, that we would have kind of 
said, hey, you need to deal with that a couple years ago. Well, now is being used by attacker groups. So now when we see these commodity malwares, we can't immediately discount them. We have to think to ourselves, okay, uh, is this a precursor or is this the first step to a more sophisticated attack? Because remember, malware is disposable now. I just use it to get in. Once I get what I need, then I don't care if you discover it and disable it. I'm switched to malware-less techniques and I'm running in memory for the most part and I'm not hitting disk anymore. So that's really the only innovation is that they're using cheaper stuff for them so they can lower the cost of attack for themselves. And then the other thing is they've changed their economic model. Their traditional, which we still do see, the traditional advanced persistent threat approach is I'm going to get in, I'm going to stay quiet, I'm going to find stuff that's valuable, I'm going to exfiltrate it, and then I'm going to sell it on the secondary market. Or if I'm a nation state, I'm going to keep it as, as stolen intellectual property. Okay, that still happens. But these ransomwares and destructive malwares you're seeing, how do you think those happened? Exactly the same way. Spear fish in, laterally traverse, privilege escalate. But then instead of doing your traditional APT approach, they decide to throw in industrial scale ransomware. Or if it's politically motivated, they'll throw in destructive malware to take your environment down. So they've simply changed their economic model. So the criminal gangs are like, hey, you know what? It's so cheap to do this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to throw ransomware in there. And even if only 15%, which is the current statistic, even if only 15% of victims pay, I'm still getting more money faster because it's direct monetization to my Bitcoin wallet. I don't have to wait to sell this data on the secondary market. And I'm doing this in bulk. So I'm gaining money by volume rather than by depth, such as an APT. So it's just a change of economic model and philosophy of how am I going to monetize my attacks? So that is the fundamental truth there. Now, we are seeing a couple innovations at 5%. I know somebody out there is asking, well, what's the 5%? We're seeing things like uh, web shells hitting your external uh, web edge. But once you get a web shell on something, what do they do? They're flipping to an identity attack because they use that web shell to capture identity and then go forth from there. We're also seeing things like supply chain attacks where they're trying to pivot into your environment through interconnections with suppliers and B2B partners. So that's also a big concern that if you're too if your if your environment is too hardened and it's too expensive to attack you directly, I'm going to go to the weakest link in the chain. I'm going to attack one of your supply chain and I'm going to try gain entry to the data or whatever my goal is to your environment via that supply chain. So those are some of the other innovations that 5% that we see are these innovative things. And every once in a while we will see a physical network attack because something, you know, very, very wrong was uh, was exposed in the environment. But those are very rare because once again, we've all been doing perimeter network security for, for 30 years. And so that's not a very attractive target to, uh, to attackers these days. So how do you get a hold of the detection and response team? Yeah, this, is the, this is the important part. <laughs> this is the important part. If you have a problem, the first call, you, if you think you have a cyber problem, the first call you should have is with your TAM. Your TAM is the most important part of this process. Now, there are times where you have a security problem and you think, ah, you know, this is not that big of a deal. Call into CSS support. Okay, you call into CSS phone support. And now, they are connected, you know, with our, the process wise, they're connected with our organization. If they see this is a bigger problem than you believed it was, then we, Get a uh, get a triage session set up, and then we take a look at it as well. So, you know, you, your TAM is not the only entry mechanism. If your TAM's not available, or you don't don't think it rises to the level that you have to talk to your TAM, and you call in a, a support case on a security situation, don't worry. Those folks on the other end of the phone know exactly what to look for. That if it's a bigger concern that you might need an incident response and engage the DART team, they absolutely will be involved with that process. And then what happens after that is that uh, between the TAM, phone support, and our team, we start scoping the situation and schedule resources and align all of that sort of thing, which happens if we find that it's an incident response level problem, that stuff happens very, very quickly. We have cases where we can get people there, you know, next day, if you're even closer than that, 
you know, rarely we can get there same day, but usually within a day or two, we're we're on site and, and we're good to go. But once again, while we're in transit, nothing's not happening. We are working with you to get things set up and preparations done uh, while we are all in transit and flight to, to get your uh, to get onto your site. And we have uh, we have members all over the world, every region of the world. So we are well covered to get to most customers relatively quickly. All right. Yeah, and you guys, you guys do a great job. I had an incident with one of my customers about ten years ago, and uh, it was a different team, right? It was it was pre you, I think, pre you guys. Uh, but we can't. They came out. They, you know, did an entire environment assessment. They figured out what was going on. They, they figured out how the breach had occurred, and uh, they helped my customer solve it. Solve it, and it was a painless experience for the customer it was awesome as painless as it can be <laughs> as painless as it can be yeah of course the breach was painful but but the resolution was you know like you said as painless as it could be wow jim that was awesome thank you for doing that you're welcome i think it's really important that we understand where we can actually advise and help our customers not only that we have help available to them but as you saw in the presentation there are three or four takeaways that we could take to our customers and say, hey, listen, I know this might not be, you know, the most glamorous thing on the block, but this is actually what's getting customers in trouble. We need to reevaluate some of these fundamentals to help you. Well, I certainly appreciate it. I really enjoyed the presentation. Do you know Kate Proctor? I am super excited that Kate is going to talk about, you know, we talked about the doom and gloom. We talked about, you know, what's happening. And, you know, the DART team does do some, you know, rapid mitigation to stop active cyber attacks, but that is in no way definitive in what customers actually need. I am super excited that Kate's going to follow up on, okay, what do we do about it? What's the next step to becoming whole in the security space? Well, she's coming up next. Say hi, Kate. Hey, Kate, I'm super excited about what you're going to have to say. <laughs>